Welcome back, I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 3 now. Um, let me write that up there a little bit better. We're in chapter 3, and uh, last time we got about one verse. <laughs> uh, we had finished up the time before in verse 11, and then uh, I had to go back, though. I had to go back to verse 8 and read from 8 to 11 all over again because of that word, finally. So verses 1 through 7 is all about the marriage relationship. It starts off how a woman's supposed to be and then how a man's supposed to be. Then verse 8 talks about finally be ye all of one mind. So you can apply verse 8 to 11 to marriage, how now in marriage both of you, not just the man, not just the woman, but both act like this. But also because we have that hard break with the word finally, be ye all of one mind, knowing that Paul is writing to all Christians, we can apply verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, to us who are saved. And we should. When we do, we find out that we that are Christians, we should be compassionate, verse 8. We should have the same mind. We should uh, love one another. We should be pitiful, full of pity. And we should be courteous. Uh, we shouldn't render evil for evil, verse 9, but we should bless each other. Uh, we're, we're going to inherit a blessing, so we ought to be nice to each other, because someday we're going to have to if we all get to heaven together. Amen? And then it says we should uh, refrain our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking guile, verse 10. We're supposed to eschew evil, which means to uh, turn aside from or turn from, get away from evil, sin, wickedness. We should stay away from it. And we should seek peace and ensue it. So verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So I find it interesting that in the passage there's two things that you could do that could kind of make God go, No, I don't think I want to answer your prayer. Number one was if a man is not doing right toward his his wife. There in verse 7 it says, Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So a man, you should uh, dwell with your wife according to knowledge. You should give honor to your wife. Love her and take care of her or God might hinder your prayer. But then it says in verse 12, you know, that the Lord's eyes or ears, ears are open unto the prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So... I want to live right. I want to do right as a Christian. I don't want my prayers to be hindered. I want God to answer my prayers, so I'm going to do my best to live for the Lord. So today we're going to start in verse 13, and hopefully, my plan is, hopefully, finish up the chapter. But in verse 13 it says, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So if you want to take it back to the marriage relationship, <laughs> uh, if you do good, nobody's going to be harmed. A man won't harm his wife if his mindset is, I want to treat her right. A wife's not going to harm her husband if her mindset is, I want to be the kind of woman that God says here and be good to my husband. So there won't be any harm there in the marriage relationship, and that's great. But also, if you uh, take it as we looked at it last time, how this could apply to all Christians, well, Christians shouldn't harm each other. The last thing we want is to hurt other Christians and harm them. We want to edify that's a great word edify edify means to build up so all Christians should want to help other Christians grow in the Lord not do the opposite which would be what tear down and uh, make fun of and mock and speak evil of others we're taught against that in verse 10 for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So who is he that will harm you? Well, that's a good question. Who's going to harm you if you do good? Well, unfortunately, there are bad people in the world that do want to harm you, and especially the more in the day and age we live. Now, I don't know if you know this, but you probably do if you've been studying my videos. We live in the last days. And it's the last days in the sense that it's right before the rapture of the church. And so this right here would be the tribulation period. This is Armageddon. This would be the millennium over here. So this is your millennial kingdom. Here's the rapture. 
and we are very close to the rapture. We are right here. Put a little red around it, kind of make it highlighted a little bit. So we are in the last days, and we are seeing in the last days some bad things. And we are seeing people in the last days want to hurt us. Now, why do you say that, Robert Breaker? Well, let's go to 2 Timothy. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us what the last days will be like. I believe that they, they start now. I, I believe this also would apply to the tribulation, that this will be like this in the tribulation. But I don't think it will be like this in the millennium. So it's got to be talking about tribulation and right before the rapture. This is what the world will be like. And it's going to be a time in which there's going to be some people out there that want to hurt you. And I hate that. I can honestly say that in my heart, I don't want to hurt anybody. I remember times in my life when um, I did some things, and let's, let's say this. How do I say this nicely? I remember a couple times in my life in school when I was in a fight. And I didn't start the fight, and I didn't want to fight. But uh, I remember one guy... Better not say his name. I just remember his last name starts with an L. He wanted to fight me. And um, he started pushing me and pushing me and screaming and calling me names and being really hateful and mean to me. And every time in my life when I've ever gotten a fight with someone and it couldn't be avoided and I had to punch them or kick them, I always remember I held back. I always held back. Because like I said, the Bible teaches to have temperance. Temperance is self-control. My daddy always taught me, don't let yourself get out of control. Always be in control of yourself. And I always remember that guy, last name starts with an L, he came after me and I remember I punched him. And when I did, I remember, I remember as I was punching, I kind of held back because I was like, I don't want to hurt him because I was in karate. And I remember in, a, another time in middle school and this guy, he was just being hateful, mean, evil, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me, and I just punched him. But I remember I held back. I didn't do as hard as I could. And when I did, it's like he didn't move. If I had done as hard as I could, it would have gone like that. But I remember it was just... and But it was hard enough. And he said, I got blood in my mouth. And he must have bit his tongue or something when I hit him. <laughs> but uh, I always remember, I, I never felt in my heart this desire to to want to hurt somebody and, and, and hit them as hard as I could because I was just thinking, I want to hurt them so bad. I've never been that kind of person, and I don't want to be. I don't ever want to hurt anybody. I don't want to harm somebody. But we live in a world in which there's people out there that want you to be hurt, and they enjoy watching other people in pain and inflicting pain on others. And they're like, Ooh, I want to hurt this person. What is that? Well, that's what the Bible calls malice and spite and hatred and, and evil. And we shouldn't want to be like that. But when is the time in the world in which there's going to be the most amount of that? Well, look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, matter of fact, we should just read the whole chapter, so let's do that. Verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So I think he's talking about the tribulation period and toward the end of the church age. And this will be the perilous times. Because we know when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, Armageddon, two Ds I think, that when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, guess what? He's going to set up his millennial kingdom and it's going to be peace. So there won't be these troublous times. So it's got to be talking about in the tribulation and right before in the time of apostasy. When people fall away, what are they falling away from? They're falling away from God and the Bible, and they're falling to the evil antichrist system. They're falling away from truth and going to a lie. And what is the lie? Well, the last days, the Bible tells us, uh, even Paul's the one that says it, they'll be, believe a lie rather than the truth. So when you're falling away from something, you usually are falling to something. And they're falling to sin, to wickedness, to evil, to the great lie, the great deception. So Paul says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. What is that? Well, we looked at that last time. And if you'll remember last time, we saw the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And what God wants is us to get saved so he can put his Holy Spirit in us, and then we can walk in the spirit. But unfortunately, in these perilous times, what are they doing? They're walking in the flesh. 
And in the flesh, they want to hurt other people. And so Paul clearly tells us, he says, Perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, wanting what isn't theirs, wanting somebody else's something. Boasters, what is that? Bragging on yourself. Proud, prideful, full of pride. Blasphemers, what does that mean? That means they look at the things of God and they make fun of it and they mock it and they laugh and say, Aha, Bible, ah, that's so dumb, aha. What else? Disobedient to parents, well, that's sad. You know, Bible, that's one of the things that the Bible says, if you're obedient to your parents, your, your days will be long upon the earth. I mean, it's, it's conditioned that if you are obedient and honor your parents, you'll live a longer life than if you're disobedient. Um, it says, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They just despise you if you're a Christian. Well, here we are in the church age, and we're supposed to be Christians. And what are we supposed to do? We who are Christians, now I like the word Christian. Uh, Christian. I don't have a problem using the word Christian. When I say Christian, I mean we who are saved. When we're saved, we're supposed to do good. Not to be saved or to stay saved, but because we are saved, now we do good. Because we serve God out of love. It's not under the law. You know, under the law, you had to serve God, but it, you were forced. You had to under the law. Here, we serve God because we want to, because we're so thankful that he shed his blood for us, and he died in our place for our sins. So, a Christian is supposed to do good. Well, guess what these people are? They hate good. So when they see you as a Christian trying to do good all the time, they say, oh, I hate you. And they want to do you harm. Then at first, um, verse 4, well, verse 3 ends with despisers of those that are good. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, do what? Turn away. What's the power? Well, there's power in the blood. <laughs> The power of the gospel is the blood of Christ. There's power in the blood. It's the blood that cleanses us from all our sins. They don't want to hear about the blood of Jesus. They don't want to hear the gospel preached of salvation. They don't want God or the Bible. They kick them out of schools. They don't allow you to pray in school. They say, no God, no Bible. And what do you see? Well, you see this great um, movement of people nowadays in this. You know what that is? That's communism. We're in the midst of these riots all over, and I don't know if you know who's behind all these riots, but if you know history, you know it's the commies. And we have communists being raised up in our world, and they're the ones out doing the riots. And they're against all that is good. Now, I didn't want to get into this too much or talk too much about it, but all over America, and a matter of fact, all over the world, there's riots going on. And these riots are put on by Antifa, who are being paid by certain people. And uh, one of the things that I saw, one of the groups out there rioting is calling themselves the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement. And you go to their website, it's all black with a red star. Well, if you just turn the star a little bit, it's upside down. That looks exactly like Satanism. They worship black with a red star. And they're called RAM, Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement, and they have a ram's head. Well, that's Satanism in a nutshell. You know, the ram's head, they worship. So it's weird. But who are these people that are wanting to riot and start it? Communists. What are communists? They hate God. What are they? The Bible says, verse 4, traitors. Because what is a communist? It's a revolutionary, someone who wants to overthrow government. Well, then that is a traitor. There's no other word for that but an outright traitor who is guilty of treason. And now why the government does nothing about it, I don't know. But there's another word for them. They're terrorists. And we'll see that here in a minute uh, when we get back to Peter because they're trying to terrorize people. They're not of God. I'll tell you that much right here. Now it says here, having a form of godliness but dividing the power thereof. What does the Bible tell us to do? Join the riots? Join the Antifa? Join the, the communists? No, we're to turn away, it says, from such turn away. Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women with sins led away with diverse lusts. So sin is the problem. It's all about lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. It's all about we want to sin, and how dare you, how dare you 
be a Christian telling us not to. See, we that are Christians, we want to walk in the Spirit, and we want to live holy. We want to, as we saw last week, sin not. We don't like sin. We want to stay away from it. But the world loves sin, and that's why they hate good and want to walk in the flesh and do evil, wicked things. Verse 7, ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So they resist truth. They don't want truth. It's not about what's true to these people. All right? We're seeing riots all over America. In every town they're having Antifa riots and they're burning things down. And the excuse is we're rioting because George Floyd was killed. Now, I look at George Floyd and I say, that's a horrible thing. If he was killed by this police officer, I, I don't think it's great that a police officer kills people. I think that's horrible. A lot of people are asking, did that really happen? Because they say, well, another guy showed up and claimed to be the twin of George Floyd, and George Floyd didn't have a twin or something like that. So I looked at that and I said, well, is George Floyd um, a good guy? How should we that are Christians look at George Floyd? Again, I think it's terrible that police kill people. I'm not in favor of that. But when you look at George Floyd, he was not a Christian man. He had a long rap sheet. He was a porn star. He also um, broke into a house and put a gun in the belly of a pregnant woman. He was a drug addict. When they caught him, I was looking at it just the other day, um, they, they, they arrested him, put his arms behind his back, and put him up against a wall, and you could see in the video him dropping a little bag with uh, phenanol or whatever they call that drug. I don't even know my drugs, so I'm not interested in drugs. But he had that behind him, and he dropped it. And so he was a drug addict. He was a porn star. He was a thug. He threatened pregnant women with a gun. Not the kind of person to make into your victim and your martyr for your uh, movement, right? So how should we as Christians view George Floyd? Well, we look at it as a tragedy. He was murdered. But then we look at the man and we say, I, I can't stand with that because as a Christian, the Bible tells me not to fornicate. And the guy was a fornicator. The Bible tells me, you know, not to do this or the other. The guy was doing things that he that they shouldn't have done. So this whole movement is based upon a martyr that was a sinner. And that's sad. And what is it? It's a mo movement of hate. They hate you, and they want to burn down your business. And what's sad to me is they're out there burning down business after business after business of black people. And yet they're saying, black lives matter, black lives matter. Well, what about the black lives of the people's business that you're burning down? Do they matter? I guess not. Because you don't care about black or white. You want to overthrow the government. That's your true agenda, so you're just using this George Floyd thing as an excuse to go riot. Because we're in perilous times. And you are a revolutionary and you want to kill people. And that's scary. Now look what it says here. They resist the truth. Verse 9, But they should proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. You look at this, you see, wow, yeah, well, I look at this and I say, that's they're in folly. They're not doing right. Verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions that came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Let me say this too, and I'll get back. I want to read the rest of this chapter, but also, what is this? They set up this George Floyd guy as their martyr, and he's their victim. So what they're doing is they're, they're trying to use as an excuse the death martyr of a man. Now, I'm not certain about this, but I looked up some things online, and that George Floyd guy was a porn star. And he worked at a nightclub with the white cop that supposedly killed him. I say supposedly because we don't know. You know, a lot of people think he did. I haven't seen the full video where he's standing on his, standing on his neck, but it is scary. Why is the guy standing on his neck? Well, I don't know if this is true, but I was connecting the dots, and I saw a video on YouTube where the guy says that this porn star, George Floyd, um, adulterated with the wife of this white guy, Chauvin, or however you say his name. Now, I'm not a lawyer. My grandpa was, but I'm not. But my dad, he thought about being a lawyer, but he wasn't. But I always talked to my grandpa, and my grandpa would always teach me, have that lawyer mind, always think like a lawyer. There's always another side of the story. and Always what is right and what is wrong. If that white guy killed 
George Floyd, what if it was premeditated murder? What if it was because, hey, there's the guy that slept with my wife. I want to kill him. If that's the case, it's not about black or white. <laughs> it's about, this guy slept with my wife. I don't like him. I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to abuse my power as a policeman to do it. But yet, they're making him to be the martyr, a sinner, George Floyd, a porn star, a drug addict, a thug, in and out of jail his whole life, doing bad things, robbing pregnant women. And then he's an adulterer on top of that, if that's true. Now, I can't prove that, but connecting the dots, looking at some videos. There were some videos that asserted that, that the reason this white guy killed George Floyd is because he was sleeping with his wife. Well, their martyr, then, is one of the biggest sinners that ever lived. And he is what they want their cause to be about. We want justice for George Floyd. No, you don't. You just want an excuse to burn things down. You're terrorists. terrorist. But that's what they're using. They're taking him as the leader of their cause. Guess who the leader of my cause is? Jesus. And Jesus isn't about hate or sin. He's about righteousness and justice. If you want justice, and that's what they're all claiming, is we want justice for George Floyd, all right? Why don't you come to Jesus? Because in Jesus' eyes, there's not white or black or green or blue or purple or beige. There's no color when it comes to salvation. Jesus didn't die on the cross for white lives only. He died for the sins of the whole world, black or white or any other color. People are running around saying, black lives matter, black lives matter. And you know what I say? How about black souls matter? That's what's most important to me. The souls of men, whether they're white or black, they need to come to Christ for salvation. Because only Jesus can save you from the fire. See, all they want to do is they want to start fires. They want to burn things down. And they want to make people suffer. They run around saying, oh, the suffering of the poor black people being attacked by, you know, the police and things like that. And okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. From what I've understood, uh, it's very seldom that a, a white cop kills a black guy. Uh, Ten cases last year. And uh, you look at the cases, only about four of them was um, black killing a white guy for no reason. It's not something that happens all the time, like they want you to think, oh, poor oppressed black guy. I don't see that. But okay, if that's, if that's what your kick is, then hey, let's, um, let's get rid of oppression. Let's all come to Christ. Because in Christ, you're not white or black in God's eyes. You're either saved or lost. And if you come to Jesus, you're going to heaven. So you can be black or white or Indian, or, and if you get saved, you'll go to heaven. And in heaven, there's no black or white. It's just everyone's the same. So if you want to know the answer to this, the riots and the terrorism and all this communist uh, revolutionary tech, it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And so he's my martyr. He died for me. And what a great martyr Jesus is. Because he's sinless. <laughs> let's look at Jesus and compare him to George Floyd. And let's see which movement is better. Black Lives Matter, running around burning down. Revolutionary abolitionist movement, Antifa, burning things down, terrorizing people, telling people, bow the knee to us, get down on your knees and bow to us, saying that you're sorry for oppressing black people. Well, I never oppressed anybody. I've never oppressed anybody. But no, the only person I'm going to bow a knee to is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that every knee shall bow someday to Jesus because he is perfect and he is sinless and he never sinned a day in his life. And he was mercilessly killed for you and me. I just find it so sad that people want to pick up a cause and they want to start a cause with a sinner. And they don't want to think about Jesus who's the only one that can wash their sins away. They'd rather go out and sin and, and do rioting and things like that. It's so sad. Well, anyway, back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I hate to say it, but we're going to see more and more and more riots, pillaging, fires, burning, as the communists go around trying to burn things down. The biggest thing they want now is to get rid of the police. And this Antifa are running around saying, we don't want police. Close down all the police stations. People are thinking that's a good idea. Do you know what happens when you don't have any police? They want to come in and fill in the void, and they want to police. They want to be the brown shirts, which is what happened in Nazi Germany. 
They want to come in and take over the place of the police so that they can take over you. See, this is a revolutionary communist ta tactic. This is not justice for a man who died. This is pure evil. It's wanting to take over. And evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And what's the Bible say about Antifa? What's the Bible say about the revolutionary abolitionist movement? What's the Bible say about communists? What's the Bible say about those people rioting in the streets? They're deceived and being deceived. Now, I don't have time to get into that and show you all the deception of that. But it's all an agenda to bring in the Antichrist system. Bring in a one world communist government in which the Antichrist takes over. Verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The best thing is to come to God and the Bible. Because the answer is that book. King James Bible. The answer is not a college or, or some sort of ideology taught in a college university. The answer is the Bible. Because verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What they're doing, these rioters, Antifa, is not righteous. They're burning down buildings that don't belong to them. And they're looting. That's called theft. The Bible says it's not supposed to steal. Verse 17, That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good, good works. So we who are saved, we're supposed to do good works as Christians. Antifa, communism, teaches bad works. Go do evil, go pillage, go attack people, go burn down things, go beat people up, go do evil, go do it in the flesh. What's the reason to do that? Because they want to get rid of cops, they want to start their own new world order, they want their own uh, communist government. And it's horrible. So now we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter, Peter chapter 3, look at verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Well, that's, that's a good question. Who's going to harm you if you're doing good? Well, in a normal society, which we've had for almost 2,000 years, if you do right, usually you're left alone. But in a communist society, they reward evil behavior and attack people that are doing good. And that's just the way it is. So Christianity is the enemy of communism. And you're going to see more and more Christians attacked by communists, by Antifa, signaled out, sought after. Because they hate those which are good. So who's going to harm you? The evil people in the perilous times. Now verse 15, but, and if you suffer. See, he's not saying in verse 13, if you do right, you won't suffer. He's not saying that. He's saying, but if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. So there is some suffering. I already read it. Yeah, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we who are saved, who are Christians, we're going to suffer. We've been really blessed in America to not see much suffering towards Christianity. But the closer we get to the coming of Christ and the more communist that our country becomes, the more we're going to see more and more attacks against Christianity. And you know what? It's going to be awful. And you need to not do evil, but to continue doing good if you're a Christian. And look what it says. Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror... <laughs> neither be troubled. So these people that he's talking about, and these people that Paul is talking about over in 2 Timothy, they're coming up in the last days, and they are evil incarnate. They are vile, wicked, ungodly, filthy people who hate God and the Bible, and they're terrorists. There's been talk in America to declare Antifa a terrorist, terrorist organization. I hope to God they do. Because Antifa, communism, um, the, the revolutionary abolitionist movement, they are terrorists. They're out terrorizing now, burning down cities, and doing horrible things. And the Bible calls them a terror. So, Donald Trump comes along, and I made a video about this, and he comes out and does his little stunt where he walks across the street from the White House and stands up, and he holds up a Bible. And he says, look at me, I'm holding up a Bible. And everyone goes, what is that? And that's what I asked in my video. I said, what, what is he doing? What is he saying? What is he saying by holding up a Bible? Is he saying, I'm going to follow this? Well, unfortunately, he held up an RSV in Spanish. That's kind of sad. 
But is he saying, this is righteous and this is justice and we need to follow this and not that? Okay, Donald Trump, if that's what you're saying by holding up what you think is the Word of God, the Bible, even though it's an RSV, so it's a corrupt version, then declare them terrorists, domestic, domestic terrorists, and an enemy of the state, because they are indeed traitors, full of treason, and the Bible even says so, the very book that you claim to you know, believe and hold up. So, treason, traitors. And the Bible says to watch out for them. And the Bible tells us that we're going to be attacked by them in the last days, and that if we suffer, we need to suffer for doing right, not for doing wrong. So let me read there again in verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you be, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, verse 15, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. So, we're supposed to have meekness, and what's weird is fear. Are we supposed to fear Antifa? I don't think that's what, they're, what he's saying. What is the fear? I know what they will call it Ram, revolutionary abolitionist movement. What is he saying? Well, as Christians, we're supposed to be meek, compassionate, caring, loving. Verse 8, all the way back to verse 8, having compassion. But what's the fear? The fear, to me, that he's, got, he's talking about in the context is being afraid of not speaking out and saying the right thing at the right time. The reason there's so many communists in the world is because Christians went and haven't spoken out against communism. Communism is a threat to our liberty. Communism is against the Constitution of the United States of America and our freedoms and our liberties. It is indeed a terrorist organization. And it needs to be declared such and we need to fight against it because it has declared war on us. And what we need to do as Christians is know the truth and speak up and speak out. And so I hope you do that. I hope you speak out. But how are we supposed to speak? We're supposed to speak out against evil. Not speak evil. <laughs> Go back to chapter 3 and verse um, 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So there is a way that we that are Christians are supposed to speak. And we're not supposed to say bad things and speak evil of others. We're supposed to speak it out against evil. Not be evil ourselves, but to say there is an evil in this world. There is a wickedness. There is something that is so vile and so ungodly. And we need to talk against it. We need to warn people, don't be a communist. Don't join Antifa. Don't join Ram. Don't be on the side of those who are living in sin and being porn stars and doing bad stuff. Live on the side of those that are doing good. Justice, peace, righteousness, that's what we want. We want peace, but they are for war. Because if you think about it, what is communism? It's a revolutionary overthrow of a government. What is that? That's war. So commies are warmongers. And we that are Christians, we should speak out against it. <clears throat> so I like verse um, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify means make clean. Sanctify, so make sure that you have God. Make sure you're saved. When we're saved, the Lord dwells in our heart by faith. And be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So how a Christian should answer someone with meekness, with fear, and with Scripture. Look at uh, 4.11. 1 Peter 4.11. If any man speak, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to speak out against evil. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to speak with meekness, with fear, and with Scripture. Well, how can we do that? How can we share Scripture with people when we're trying to reach these people for Jesus and they've been to a secular school, a university, that taught them communism and taught them that the God of the Bible isn't real and that the Bible's just a book written by man and you shouldn't take the Bible seriously. How do we deal with people like that? It's kind of hard. 
but they hate God and hate the Bible. And if these people, I guarantee, if these people get in charge, they will start burning all books, just like the Nazis, just like the communists. But we that are Christians, we need to speak out and speak about what's righteous and just and do right. All right, so continue there um, in verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereof they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So what are we supposed to do? These people we know are going to speak evil of us, and they do. So what are we supposed to do? Everything that we can, with as much as life within us, to live peaceably with all men, as Paul says, we're supposed to do good so that they can't say anything against us. When we start cussing, when we start saying bad words, when we start doing bad, then they can say, ah, ha, ha, you're just so wicked. Never give them an inch. Never allow them to say something bad about you. Live righteous, live just, do good, so that they can't say anything against you. And then tell them the truth. Hey, you guys are the sinners. Many of these people, many communists, are devil worshipers. Luciferians. They're following Satan. They're following Lucy rather than God. Now look at verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing uh, than for evil-doing. Now, this world is a world in which we're going to suffer. So Peter here is talking about suffering. And if you remember, I talked about that the book of 1 Peter, the theme of the book of 1 Peter is what? Suffering. And now we're really getting into it. Chapter 3, chapter 4, lots to do about suffering. And so he's talking about marriage. I think that's funny. In the first couple of verses, and he says you suffer. Well, sometimes in marriage you suffer. Because what is marriage? Both sides suffering. A man puts down his wants and desires for those of his wife. A wife puts down her wants and desires for those of her husband. And you really do have to suffer for your, for your better half. By that I mean you don't just live for yourself and do what you want. You say, well, there's some things I'm not going to do because I want to please you and vice versa. So there's a suffering in marriage. But then we go a little longer. There's a suffering of keeping our tongue and not saying things that we shouldn't with our mouth. Verses 8, 9, 10. And treating other people. And so we suffer in that way of, of being courteous to people. Sometimes it's hard to be nice to other people. <laughs> Very hard. But we should. And then he continues and he talks about there's going to be some evil people out there who try to terrorize you. And they're going to come after you. And you're going to suffer. They're probably going to do bad things. They might burn down your business like they've been doing in, in many cities. Uh, what's sad is they've been yelling and screaming saying, when we're done burning down the cities, well, we're going to come out to the suburbs. Okay, well, you do that, <laughs> you're going to be sorry is all I can say. My neighbors here, I think every one of them is armed. And uh, we kind of have a little neighborhood watch here. So you come out here, you just might not leave. I mean, I hate to say it, but my neighbors are crazy. <laughs> and uh, they, they believe in protecting what's ours. And so you want to come out here and burn down stuff, you may not make it out. That's all I'm saying. You, you, as far as we're concerned, you're doing evil by burning down and terrorizing people, and we have the right to self-defense. And so we believe in that. But I don't want to hurt people. I want to do what's right. And I'll suffer if I can. But if someone attacks, well, you've got no choice but protect yourself. But then it talks about having a good conscience. And you should have a good conscience. And if you have a good conscience and you do right and you suffer for it, it's better to suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Verse 17. So there's two kinds of suffering. There's two kinds of suffering. And the two kinds of suffering are this. Number one, for doing right. And suffering for doing wrong. What I've chosen to do in my ministry and in my life is to do right. I don't want to do wrong. And oftentimes when you choose the right path and to do right, it's harder than if you choose to do wrong. Now I don't have time to get into that, but I went to a certain Bible school, and I might as well just tell on some of the other people that I knew <laughs> that went there since I haven't seen them in years. But I went to a certain Bible school when I graduated, the Lord called me to be a missionary. And so I talked to some of these other men that were missionaries, 
and uh, had gone to the mission field. And I said, well, God's called me to Honduras to be a missionary. What should I do? And some of those men set me down. They said, now, Brother Breaker, you call up pastors all over America. You ask them for a meeting. You ask them to support you as a missionary. And they said, and you keep your mouth shut and you don't say anything. And if they tell you to do this or do that, you do it. And they said, you just pretend to be whatever they want you to be so you can get their money. And then you go to the mission field with their money. That didn't set right with me. That's called compromising. And I don't ever want to compromise my belief. I don't believe it's right to compromise. To compromise is to not take a stand for what's right. And just say, well, I can not put up with this, or I, can, I'll, I won't preach on that, or I won't. And I think that's wrong. So I said, that's a path I will not do. I'd rather do right. And uh, many missionaries, they go out and they go to different churches. It takes them about three years to get support as a missionary, and then they go to a foreign field. I watched some of those men that told me, counseled me, to compromise. And they got to the mission field by lying to pastors and telling pastors whatever they wanted to hear. Pastors say, what do you believe about this doctrine? Oh, whatever you do. <laughs> they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't stand for what they believed. And many of them got to the mission field, and within four or five years they had to come back and raise more support. Because the men found out that they had lied to them. And that they didn't believe like they do. So they canceled their support. So I looked at them as compromisers. So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stand for what I believe. I'm a King James Bible believer only. And I have my own uh, convictions. And I believe what the book says. And if you don't, then don't support me. Then don't send me money. Because I don't want to be rewarded for doing wrong. I would rather suffer for doing right. Well, it took me three years to get to the mission field as a missionary. I was single. I wasn't married. I got there in 2001 until 2007. Came back in 2005 to get married. Um, but I went with probably half of what most missionaries have. And when I was on deputation, which is what we call it when we travel to churches and preach and try to raise support to, uh, every month, they send you so much to go as a missionary to Honduras. And uh, a lot of pastors would tell me, uh, you'll never make it, man. I said, why is that? And they said, because you, because you don't compromise. I said, where in the Bible does it tell me to stand? Doesn't the Bible tell me to stand? So you, you're telling me, what is your counsel? Uh, our counsel is don't stand so hard on so much stuff. I said, no. If I believe it and the Bible says it, then I'm going to stand on it. It makes no difference to me if you believe it or not. And oftentimes, many pastors told me, well, I don't want to support you because I don't believe what you do on such and such. And usually with some little stupid little pet peeve doctrine of theirs that had nothing to do with salvation or anything else. Who cares if you believe that or not? But it took me a while. And uh, because of that, I was uh, ridiculed. I was name called. Uh, people told me um, uh, that people were talking bad about me and saying things that weren't true and other things like this. And I just, I just said, I don't care. I can sleep at night with a good conscience. Look what it says in verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. I hope they're ashamed. So what I did is I went and I started deputation and some people said things about me weren't true or whatever and I just, I just brushed it off and I could sleep at night. I had a good conscience. The old saying is a good conscience sleeps well in a thunderstorm. If you do wrong, you don't sleep well because you're always worrying, oh, is someone going to find out I did wrong? But if you will stand for what's right and people don't like you, it doesn't bother you. You're just like, I don't care. To this day, you can still go to the Internet and find a couple of websites where there are other missionaries that lie about me, say things that aren't true. Most of it is about the Spanish Bible. And they call me names and they say things about me that aren't true. I wish they'd take that down. I really do, because it's lies, and they're spreading more lies to other people. But it doesn't bother me because I'm standing on the truth. I have nothing to apologize for. I know what the Bible says. And I'm not going to compromise for those people. So, I'm suffering for well-doing rather than evil-doing. But either way, you're going to suffer. <laughs> so you might as well make up your mind. It's, it's worth it to suffer for doing right. And it's better to suffer for doing right than to suffer for doing wrong. Because when you do wrong, then you suffer. Let's say you go to a bank and you rob a bank. Well, now you're going to have to go to jail. All right? And you're going to suffer in jail for 20, 30 years, however long you know you get for, for robbery. 
And that stinks to have to suffer. And the whole time you're there, you know, it's all my fault. It's all my fault I'm here. Why did I do that? Why? And then you have guilt involved, and then you feel bad. But if you do right, and something happens, you go, well, what do I have to lose? I don't care. They lied about me. I didn't do it, so I'm going to go to sleep. And you sleep well, knowing that you've done right. Now, as an illustration is verse 18, Christ. He's going to talk about now the sufferings of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the greatest example in the whole Bible of suffering for doing right rather than doing wrong. They crucified Jesus Christ on an old rugged cross. That's what the Romans did for malefactors. malefactors. That's what the Romans did to criminals. If a man was a criminal, he was nailed to the cross and put up there and crucified. Was Jesus a criminal? No. No, Jesus did not sin. The Bible says, He that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus never sinned, and yet He suffered the same things that, all, that criminals had to suffer for us. So here's an example of Jesus Christ. So verse 18 is an amazing verse, because verse 18 is the gospel in one verse. Now the gospel, according to Paul, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. So there's the gospel. And I'm going to read that here in a minute, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the gospel has five points. And what's amazing is it's in four verses. But here Peter comes over here, and in 1 Peter 3, 18, he gives us the gospel in one verse. <laughs> so he sums it up very nicely in 1 Peter 3, 18. Now, I've come across these hyper-dispensationalists in my life, and they say, no, no, you can't read Peter. Nothing in Peter is for us today. And I say, well, that stinks, because 1 Peter 3.18 is a great verse to show a lost person how to be saved. And yet, you tell me I can't read this. It's not for today. So I don't believe that. As we're going through 1 Peter, I've been showing you time and again what Peter is saying lines up with Paul. Because Peter and Paul got together and talked. And Paul said, hey, Peter, guess what? God showed me this, this, and this. God showed me the gospel. Here's the gospel. And so Peter does a wonderful job of summing up the gospel in 1 Peter 3.18. Let's read it. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and see what the gospel is. And the gospel has five points. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1-4, through 4, here's the gospel. Moreover, brethren, verse 1, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein ye, look at that, stand. That's kind of interesting. I take my stand on this gospel, because this is the gospel that does what? Saves. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. We're saved by this gospel. Unless you believed in vain. If you keep a memory of what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. How did he die? He shed his blood. So that blood is the most important part of the gospel. It's the blood-stained gospel. It's the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. So it's all about the atonement. And we saw Peter talking all about the precious blood in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. So clearly, 1 Peter can apply to the church age, and it does. There are a lot of verses in there that do line up with Paul that we can take for us today. So the Gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We see five points in this Gospel. Let's see if I can get them up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's how Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. All right, so you see five points of the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 given to Paul. Now go back to 1 Peter 3, 18. Let's see if we can find these five points in the gospel, of the gospel in one verse. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. All right, so Christ suffered for our sins. And how did he suffer? He died. He didn't just suffer, he died. So he suffered and died for our sins. So there's the first two. Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. All right, so he's the just, we're the unjust. That he might bring us to God, 
being put to death in the flesh, put to death in the flesh, all right, there's where he died, put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So he's put to death in the flesh, but he's quickened in the Spirit. Well, he had to have been buried, so that's understood in there. And he once died for sins, but, put, but quickened by the Spirit. So I see death, burial, resurrection in that verse. Now, I don't really see according to the Scriptures, although we did read in verse 11, the, spirit, uh, the speak of the oracles of God, and uh, we do see him talking about the Bible before. So it's not completely lined up, but it's enough of where you see the death, burial, and resurrection, and it's the just for the unjust, dying for our sins. So you have the sacrificial death of Christ and his resurrection being taught by Peter, and it sounds like the gospel in one verse. Death, Christ died, being put to death in the flesh, Christ died. He once suffered for our sins, okay? He was put to death in the flesh, but he's quickened in the spirit. Quickened means brought to life, so he rose again. And so what you have there is, is the Gospel of Paul in one verse instead of in four different verses. And that's a great verse to use to deal with a lost person. I read that verse and I go to a lost person and I go, let me read this to you. And I read it and I say, and you see what that says? Jesus Christ died once for your sins. Now when that verse says the just for the unjust, who's the just? Just means never sinned. He's righteous. Who's the righteous one and who's the unrighteous? Who's the unjust? And the sinner says, me, I'm a sinner. Jesus, who didn't sin, died for me, the sinner. And so you clearly can use that verse. So the just for the unjust. So I, I like 1 Peter 3.18. I think it's a good verse. So we read all this and we see all this. We see a very evangelistic message for Peter. He's speaking of the suffering of Christ. Now, notice at the beginning of 1 Peter 3.18 what it says. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. So he uses the term once. Now that reminds me of Paul. I can't read 1 Peter without thinking of a lot of the things that Paul says. And I clearly see 1 Peter is echoing a lot of things that Paul says. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. That one little word, once. Once suffered. One sacrifice. Look what it says. Uh, Hebrews 10, 10 through 12. Hebrews 10, 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So one sacrifice forever. Once. Now why is that important? Well, because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross isn't enough. No, they don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. No, unfortunately, he died on the cross, but they believe in the Roman Catholic Mass. And they say, you have to come to our church and we do the Mass, which is a continual sacrifice. And we lift up Jesus and we put him on the cross and we sacrifice him over and over. So if you're a Roman Catholic, you cannot believe that Jesus died once for sins. You have to believe that the priest is doing it over and over and over every time you go to the Mass. Now that is blasphemy. Because that's saying that the one sacrifice of Jesus once and forever on the cross was not powerful enough to save you. It has to be done over and over again. And who's doing it? Those priests. And we just read the verse where Paul says that every time the priest does it, it can never take away sins. I don't understand how you could be a Roman Catholic and believe that. I just don't, and I can't accept the Catholic doctrine because it says that the one sacrifice of Jesus isn't enough, and that it doesn't take away sins. They have to do it themselves. No, Jesus said it, Peter says it, Paul says it, one sacrifice forever, set down on the right hand of God. So we go here back to 1 Peter, and I wanted to finish this up, so there's a lot more to get into, a lot more that I could talk about, but let's go here to verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, the context is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died, was buried, and then rose again. He was quickened. Well, when he was buried, that was his body that went to the grave. But his soul, when it died, his soul went down under the ground. And you have over here on this side, the place called hell. And over here there was a place known as Abraham's bosom. I'll just call it Abe's bosom. 
everyone who died before Jesus died on the cross that obeyed God and did what God said and they weren't going to hell because they had done a blood sacrifice for their sins those people when they died went to Abraham's bosom this would include Abraham well the first one would have been Abel and you know all the Old Testament if you will saints but they couldn't go to heaven because the blood of animals and bulls and goats wasn't enough to get a person saved it took the eternal sacrifice the eternal salvation that Jesus brought in order to take them out and so when Jesus rose again from the dead he took them up to heaven with him they're called the first fruits so when Jesus died his body was placed into that grave while his soul came down here and the soul came down here and Jesus preached three days and three nights Jesus was in the heart of the earth and he said something look what it says here by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison what are spirits well Hebrews 1 verse 7 and then verse 14 it says that a spirit is an angel angels are called ministering spirits of course we have fallen angels too they're called unclean spirits so there are some spirits that were in hell that Jesus spoke to who do you think those might have been those spirits in hell well he tells us in 2nd Peter 2nd Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 look what it says 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered in them chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, but spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So there was in hell the fallen angels. And way back in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about how these angels fell, and they mated with the daughters of men, and they produced giants. And so these spirits, when Noah's flood came, they were taken and put down into hell. So when Jesus died, he came down here, and he was down here for three days and three nights, and he spoke to those angels. Now I wonder what he said. <laughs> but then he also spoke to the people in Abraham's bosom, and he said, hey, I'm the one you've been waiting for, because way back in Genesis chapter 3, there was a promise to everybody that there would someday come a promised seed, the seed of a woman. So I'm sure they knew who that was. They called him the Christ or the Messiah, but they didn't know his name was Jesus. They were always looking for that one promised seed that someday would come in the future to redeem mankind. And here he is. And so he came down here, and Jesus spoke to these spirits, these angels, and he spoke to those in Abraham's bosom, and then he took them up when he rose again on the third day. Well, so much more that I could say there, but let's go back. Look at the context of verse 19, by which also he went and preached into the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was in a preparing, where a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So the context is Noah's flood. So Noah's flood, everyone was killed. The whole world was so evil and wicked that everyone in the world went to hell except for Noah and his family. Eight all total. That's when God took also the fallen angels and put them down here. Now, after the flood, there were some angels that fell after that. And that's another story. But Jesus went down and talked to them. Lots more I could talk about of that. But they were saved physically by water, not spiritually. Noah was saved in his body with his family from the flood and from dying. So it's not they were saved by water. It means their souls were saved. That's not what it's talking about. But there are people that will read this passage and they'll say, well, this passage is talking about how you're saved by water baptism. And look at verse 20. Water baptism saves. And you look at that and you go, no, that's not, that's not at all what it's talking about. Look at the next verse, verse 21. Now, many people will use a different version of the Bible than the King James. And when they do, they use a watered-down, perverted version that comes from the Alexandrian manuscripts. Those are the manuscripts that the Catholic Church used and perverted. And if you have another version of the Bible, these couple of first words are missing. And so your Bible says, even baptism, baptism doth also now save us. But that is not what the King James says, and that is not what the pure text from Peter and the early apostles said. Why do they leave off the like figure whereunto even? Why do they leave that off? Well, because water baptism is a figure of salvation and not salvation itself. 
I have a video on YouTube that I would suggest you watch entitled, Is Water Baptism Essential for Salvation? And the answer is no. We are not saved by water baptism. But there are people out there today that teach that. The Catholic Church teaches that you have to be baptized in water as an infant for the remission of your sins, or the original sins, or however they call it. So they have taken out words from the Bible to try to teach that you're saved by water baptism. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work because these words are in the majority text, which is the Texas Receptus. So Peter is not saying you're saved by water baptism. When he says they were saved by water in verse 20, he's not saying their souls were saved. He's saying they were all saved by floating above the water. And matter of fact, that's a type of the rapture. We're all going to get out. We're going to be above the world when the judgment of God falls in the tribulation. Well, those eight souls were above the world floating in an ark whenever the, the wrath of God was poured out in the day of Noah. So let's look at verse 21 and let me show you why it's not saying you're saved by water baptism. The like figure wherein to even baptism does also now save us. Now look what he says. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. <laughs> so it's not washing your flesh with water. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you're saved when you're baptized in water. That's not what he's saying. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 6 and other places that when we're saved, we're saved by the Holy Spirit, by believing the gospel, Ephesians 1.13, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit as promised. We're baptized with the Spirit. So it's not water baptism that saves us. It's the Spirit of God comes in when we trust the blood atonement of Christ. Now, there's so many verses that I could go to, but there are people out there today that want you to believe that water baptism saves but it's not water that saves you. When we're saved, we're buried with Christ and we're risen with Him. So our body, we're still in our body, but we have the Spirit of God within us when we're saved. So it's not a water baptism salvation. And people try to take this verse and twist it. Now let me show you what um, Paul says. Those out there who try to teach water baptism saves you, they have many different names. There's some that call themselves Campbellites because Alexander Campbell taught this false doctrine that water baptism saves. Well, if we're saved by water baptism, then that's a work. So we're saved by works. No, that's not the way it is. If we're saved by water baptism, then it should be in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and that when you're baptized, then you're saved, but we don't see it. It's believing in how Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again, third day according to the scriptures. Romans 3.25 says, through faith in the blood, that we're saved. And we're saved through the gospel, Romans 1.16. Paul never says you're saved by water baptism. Look what he says, 1 Corinthians 1.14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. He's talking about water baptism. Now, if you're saved by water baptism, why would Paul say, I'm glad you guys didn't get saved? That's what he's saying if water baptism saves you. But he's not saying that. He continues, lest any should say, I have baptized in my own name, on my own name, and I baptized also the house of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. Well, if you're saved by water baptism, then why wasn't Paul all into trying to make sure everyone was baptized? Because that's not how we're saved. It's not water that saves us. It's the gospel. And then he continues in verse 17, and he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. There's salvation. Salvation, the power of God, is the gospel. It's the gospel that saves us. We're saved by faith in the gospel, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13. It's not water baptism that saves us. So if someone goes to 1 Peter 3.21 and they're trying to preach water baptism saves, it says the like figure wherein to baptism. And so baptism, water baptism, is a figure of salvation. It's not saving you. It's a type of, of what's happened when, when Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. After you're saved, you can be baptized in water, and you're saying, I identify with Christ. I have been baptized. I have died with Him and risen again. I have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a figure of what you already have when you're saved. 
So that's what he's saying there. But people don't like that. That's why a lot of your cults, a lot of your religious sects that are off on their doctrine that teach salvation is by water, they don't like the King James. So they say, I've got to find another version. Oh, oh, look, the NIV. Oh, look, the NRSV. Oh, look, oh, look at these other Bibles. And they say baptism doth also now save us. Ooh, let's use those because it makes us teach our doctrine and it's easier to teach water baptism saves. Now, if they read the rest of the verse, they wouldn't get messed up because it says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's not saying water baptism saves you. But there's a lot of people that will take that verse and they'll say, oh, it's trying to say water baptism saves, and it's what it's saying. There's a lot more I could go into, but I've got a lot to, else to do, so I've got to move on. Well, let me go to one more place, Mark 16, 16. A lot of people will also go to Mark 16 and 16, and they'll say, well, Mark 16, 16 says... And you go, yeah, Mark 16, 16 was Jews talking to Jews about what a Jew was supposed to do. And if you read the book of Acts, you see the book of Acts is God still dealing with Jews until he gets about to chapter 8. Then he starts going more to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected them completely. And then you get to Paul's ministry. And in Paul's ministry, he says, I think God, I baptize none of you except a couple of people. Because he says, you're not saved by water baptism. So it's not water baptism that saves. But look at... Uh, Mark 16, 16. Did I say Luke? I might have said Luke if I said that. I'm in Luke right now. I should have been in Mark. Mark 16, 16. This is what people try to do, and this is how you get a cult started. People don't read the Bible, and they don't rightly divide. Mark 16, 16 says this. He that believeth him and is baptized shall be saved. And they stop right there. But guess what? That's not the end of the verse. But that's where they stop. They say, he that believeth and baptized shall be saved. So if you just believe Jesus is the Messiah and you get baptized in water, then you'll be saved. And they say that salvation is through water baptism and belief. They are lying to you because they didn't read the rest of the verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So salvation isn't based upon you being believing and baptizing. It's salvation is based upon whether or not you believed. Because salvation is by faith. You can be baptized too, but don't trust in your baptism and think that saved you. You must only trust in the gospel because Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom we also trusted. After that you believed the gospel. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation is by faith. Ephesians 2.8.9 For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not water baptism that saves us. It's faith alone in the finished work of Christ. I could go into a lot more on that, but I have s several videos on YouTube about water baptism. So I would ask you to look at them. A lot more that I could go into um, on that, but we'll close at verse 22. The end of verse 21 says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then a colon. So you go into the next part, and it says, who has gone into heaven? and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So Jesus Christ is in heaven on the right hand of God. He rose again. You can go there with them when you die if you're saved. But it's not the water baptism that saves you, it's whether or not you've believed the gospel. And Peter even says that early on in the beginning of the book, you know, um, believing the gospel, the power of your faith, redeemed through the precious blood of Christ. It's just so sad that a lot of people they don't understand. They think this blue liquid called baptism is going to save you. That's just H2O. H2O doesn't save. What saves us is the red liquid, the blood of Christ. And the Bible tells us the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth from all sin. So all that water can do is get your flesh wet. But if you get baptized in water, that doesn't mean you're saved. I mean, I take a bath every night. I'm not saved every time I take a bath. No, the Bible teaches that I have a soul. And if I go down in water, the water doesn't touch my soul. My soul is what needs the sin washed off of it. And only that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. So salvation is through the blood, not through water baptism. So I've gone a little long today. I'm sorry about that. I hope this is a blessing to you. A lot more I'd like to say. But we finally finished chapter 3. Woohoo! And so next time we'll start in chapter 4. But the theme of the whole book is the suffering of Christ. If you think water baptism saves you, then you're saying you're saved by what you do, and so Jesus suffered for nothing? Is that what it's all about? So why did he die? If you can be saved by your baptism. No, salvation isn't by water and what you do. Salvation is by faith in the blood and what Jesus did. 
And that's why I don't like new versions of the Bible taking out whole passages. And it goes back thousands of years to where someone didn't like that. Their doctrine was, well, water baptism saves. Oh, oh, there's a verse that says it's only a figure that saves you. Oh, no, no, no. we gotta, we got to change this. No, I don't want it changed. I want it as it's supposed to read. And it reads, we're in the like figure of baptism. So baptism is a figure of salvation. It's not what saves you. It's a figure of how we're saved through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I hope I said that right. I hope you can understand. See you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.